All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Brian Story. Um, I'll be your uh, sort of facilitator for today's webinar. Um, before we get started, I'll give folks another 20 or 30 seconds just to respond to this uh, little warm up we have here. And as an example, this is a the sort of uh, quick uh, beginning engagement activity that you can use to engage your students on Google Classroom as well. Uh, start with a lighthearted question. Uh, maybe this is how you begin your day to make sure that they're checking in on their accounts. Uh, but this is just one idea that you can take advantage of in the distance learning environment. And we'll get started in about 10 seconds. I want to go ahead and uh, just give a shout out. We have people from southwestern Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Los Angeles, uh, in my home state of North Carolina. We have someone in Dunn right down the street. Welcome. Uh, folks from Iowa and uh, someone who likes a giraffe. Uh, apologies to those of you I didn't get to uh, so far, um, but thank you for sharing and I'm glad all of you could join us today. So the goal of this webinar is to give tips to teachers who need to learn how to use assessments in the distance learning environment. We're going to share some tips today uh, about uh, how you can make assessments work in this new and challenging space uh, and kind of uh, walk through some of the ways that you can leverage Google Classroom to make that happen. Uh, to reach this goal today, uh, we're going to start with just some introductions and basics, uh, talk about the, uh, the main sort of challenges that teachers are dealing with, and kind of zero in on, uh, you know, how we can help teachers deliver instructions to students, make sense of their data, uh, et cetera. And then we're going to follow that up with a question and answer session so that everybody can make sure their questions are answered. And then uh, we will wrap up by sharing some additional resources. At any time, you can feel free to uh, share a question in the chat, and we will be happy to assist you. All right, so introductions and basics. Uh, just before we get started here, uh, make sure that your microphone is on mute. The microphone control is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen in the Zoom, uh, and then your video control is right next to that in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, you can feel free to turn your video on, but just make sure that your microphone is off. Finally, in the center bottom of your screen, you can see the, uh, the chat icon. You can click that to go ahead and ask your questions and provide feedback. Uh, just as a side note, um, uh, the assessments website has been updated uh, with our uh, distance learning response page uh, in response to the current crisis so that teachers can go and take advantage of resources. Uh, that's located at the top of assessments.org. And when you click that, uh, we have various links, uh, video tutorials, resources that you can use. Uh, we have access to our teacher support modules, which walk you through everything that you need to know about how to use assessments. And then also uh, our various webinar and virtual workshop offerings uh, where you can sign up for those. Um, and this would be one of those sessions. Okay, so distance learning challenges and tips. So first and foremost, uh, make sure that uh, you know, as you're doing, going through this process and dealing with these challenges, uh, that you're being kind to yourself uh, make sure that you take it slow and understand this is new territory for a lot of folks and make sure that you start simple. Uh, with that in mind, uh, fill your toolbox. Use the digital tools that you already like to use, including assessments. Uh, and again, keep it simple and start slow to build your students' confidence in this new context. Next, uh, just as within your classroom, make sure that you're setting your expectations on when and how communication will happen. Uh, make sure students know uh, what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, in some cases, you may be able to actually plan FaceTime or video chats with your students, although we understand that uh, not all teachers can, can do that. Uh, next, make sure that you have defined your new routine around this new situation. Uh, what do you want a school day to look like? Uh, you know, do you have a realistic learning goal for the day? We know in many cases teachers are limited, uh, much more limited now in how much instructional time or how much work time uh, they can provide to students. So it's worthwhile to consider uh, what your routine looks like within those bounds. And then reconsidering the school day. Uh, you know, there are things like multi-day assignments, projects uh, that you may decide to engage students in in this kind of environment that may work better. 
Um, so consider what kinds of assignments and activities uh, might work better in this context uh, now that the school day is kind of different. Uh, and just to sort of set some context here, usually before, uh, you know, you've done the four steps of assistance, uh, creating assignments, assisting students through immediate feedback, uh, assessing their class performance and analyzing their answers uh, together, uh, usually you've taught something, right? And so we want to acknowledge that uh, because in this new distance learning environment, uh, it's one of the key areas where teachers might be wondering, well, what do I do? Um, so uh, now that you have to teach students from a distance, the questions become, how can I deliver instruction to students and how can I meaningfully analyze uh, answers and data with them uh, when they're not in the classroom in front of me? Uh, and so that's going to kind of guide uh, what we talk about today. Uh, namely, we're going to talk about help and hints and tips around delivering instruction to students and making sense of data for students. So now's a good time for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and post those in the chat uh, and uh, we will respond to those uh, aloud to the group if they're relevant to the group. Um, and Christina, do we have any big questions? Yeah, a lot of cool animals people like, but nothing, nothing in the question department. All right, well, like I said, feel free to post those anytime throughout this webinar. Uh, we'll be happy to respond in any questions where, uh, you know, they're relevant to, for everybody to hear. We'll be sure to share those out loud and, and respond to those. So delivering instruction to students. Uh, today we're going to kind of talk about four tips for delivering digital instruction, uh, and all of this is sort of through Google Classroom. Uh, we're going to talk about attaching instructions and resources to assignments. Uh, adding a comment to an assignment, uh, making assignments for specific students, and making or finding instructional videos. Uh, obviously, nothing replaces uh, you know, what you do with your students in person in your classroom, uh, but there are ways to sort of roughly approximate some of those interactions uh, in the distance learning environment where you may be able to actually uh, you know, deliver the sort of high quality instruction that you want. Uh, as a side note, before we move on, uh, you know, before you've done anything in Google Classroom, typically uh, you have A, decided which content you want to assign, B, selected the problems that you want students to do, and then C, you've assigned those problems to Google Classroom for students to actually complete them. So the first thing we'll talk about is attaching instructions and resources in Google Classroom. Uh, and with these tips, what I'm gonna try to do where possible is just show you what this looks like here, uh, and then I'll actually demo what it looks like in Google Classroom so that you can see the steps in action. All right, so typically what you can do is click the triple dot next to any assignment in the classwork tab of uh, the class in question. Uh, and then there you'll see uh, the option to edit. And when you click that, it'll bring up this box where you can enter instructions. And you can also either add resources that you already have, or you can use the Google Suite to create new resources for your students. So now we're gonna uh, just check this out really quickly. And I'm gonna shift over to our demo class. It's just called Your Class. Not too creative with the name here. Um, but I'm gonna go to the Classwork tab. Uh, and I'm gonna go to this assignment here and click Edit. And you can see here, I can go ahead and type in instructions uh, or I can uh, add a resource like a link uh, to a YouTube clip, uh, a link to a web page, uh, maybe a file that I want to share with students or even something that's already created in Google Drive. Or I can just click create and create a resources from the Google Suite uh, right here. Okay, the next tip is adding comments to an assignment uh, for the entire class. So typically, you know, when you're planning a lesson, you're thinking about uh, what are the questions I can anticipate that I can answer on the front end so I don't have 15 different kids asking me the same question, right? Uh, and obviously it's difficult to manage that from a distance, but uh, you know, the way that you can do that uh, with Google Classroom is actually just putting a comment on the assignment that goes out to all the students in that class. To do this, uh, you can click the desired assignment in the classwork tab. Uh, then you click view assignment. And then make sure you're in the instructions tab at the top of the page and you'll see a class comment section where you can put a comment and every student will be able to see that comment uh, on their assignment. And I'm just gonna show you what this looks like. So I'm gonna click this assignment, click view assignment, go to the instructions tab here. 
And then I can go ahead and add my comment uh, to students right here. Okay. And again, uh, before you're doing anything in Google Classroom, just as a brief reminder, you've already A, selected the problems that you wanted to assign, B, uh, decided whether you want to select all of them or pick from a specific set, uh, and then C, uh, you've uh, pushed those assignments to Google Classroom for students to finish them. So Brian? Yep. So I can't actually make my assignment, add all my resources first, and then connect assistance to it? Yes, that's, uh, that's correct. So uh, in order to add resources, you want to go ahead and push that assignment into Google Classroom uh, to the classes, to the relevant classes. And then from there, uh, you want to go to your classwork tab, uh, click any assignment here, and you can add your resources from this edit tab like I showed you. Uh, any other questions, Christina? Um, just a little bit. Is someone saying you're going a little fast? So can you just show us actually adding a resource? Because this idea that we, that you, so like right what I'm seeing there is sure. the assignment with the assistance. And I know it has an assistance thing because I saw the little assistance logo. Sure. So at, at, maybe just showing that again and actually adding some sort of resource. Sure. So uh, I'll just start from the main screen here. Like if you click into your class, this is what you see. Uh, most teachers want to live in the classwork tab, and that's also typically where you're going to edit your assignments and customize them or add resources. And so I'm going to go to the classwork tab for this class. Uh, and then when I click the assignment I want to look at, you get the drop down, but you can also see the triple dot here on the right. Uh, and you can click that and click edit. Uh, and then from here, you can click add. Uh, and then you can add a file, uh, let's say from your computer. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, my drive and uh, I'm just going to... Um, Let's see, add a picture of one of our lovely teachers uh, doing an assignment report with their students. Uh, obviously not relevant to the specific assignment about proportional relationships, but just to kind of show you what that looks like. And those resources uh, will appear here. And you can also, uh, you know, specify if you want the student to edit or to view the file. Any other questions, Christina? Um, someone was asking how you actually get the original assignment into the, the one, the, the original assistance assignment. So how do you get assistance. the original? Oh, how do you get how do you get it from assessments to Google? Yeah, just okay. real quick. Sure. So uh, to do that, there's some people who are new to assessments. Absolutely. So uh, you want to go to login, and I'm in uh, incognito mode right now. So okay, log me in as your name. Uh, from here, you can access our list of content, uh, and let's say you teach uh, open up resources. You can click in here. Uh, and you can access the units that you want to access. Uh, let's say we want to go to expressions and equations here, uh, and you can choose from the tasks that are also available on the Open Up Resources website, mainly the practice problems, student-facing tasks and cooldowns. Uh, and then once you've gone in and you've selected a specific problem set, you'll see all the problems listed there. And you can either select all of the problems and assign them, or you can select one problem uh, in this case, I'll just do the, the one problem. Uh, you can also, from this screen... Hey, uh, Brian? Yes? Maybe pick one that's not just multiple choice, because I think somebody else asked whether these are dynamic, and so maybe you can then um, show how it works. Yeah, sure. Um, let me go back here. I'll just go back to explore content. Um, we will pick... You know what, let's just do the getting started with students. Um, we'll do this. Uh, and so this, we actually have a problem set that's available to teachers uh, where you can have your students do it and it will actually show them, um, <clears throat> you know, how they can use assessments, how assessments works basically. Uh, so you can select all problems or select one individually and then click uh, assign to Google Classroom. Uh, you can select your class. You can put your release or due date on it, uh, although I'll leave that blank for the purposes of this activity. And then you click assign. And once you click assign and that loads, you can actually click view and it'll take you straight to uh, that class and you can see the assignment listed right there in the stream. You can also then go to your classwork tab and you can see that assignment uh, right there. Uh, and you can 
edit it the way that we've described so far. Nice. Um, any other questions? I think that's it for now. So I'll, I'll keep looking at these. You can keep going. Cool. Sure. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So uh, like I said, you've already selected problems and pushed the assignment to students uh, in your class uh, before um, you've proceeded to actually edit anything in Google. The next tip I want to talk about is assigning to only some students. Uh, you know, typically in class, you know, you might create some kind of differentiated lesson. You might give kids different activities based on their skill level coming in or their amount of processing time. In many cases, uh, students' skill levels and processing times vary quite dramatically. Uh, and so you might be thinking about how can you adjust for those things in this environment, right? Uh, and so I just wanted to show you quickly how you can uh, do this in Google. Uh, and the first thing is you just go ahead and assign it, uh, assign whatever problem sets you want to assign to, uh, to the class that you want to get them. Uh, typically, you know, when you assign through assessments, it's going to automatically go to all students. But once you push it into Google, you can go back to that edit button that I showed you. And then once you click edit, you'll see a four option in the top right corner. And underneath that, you can click the drop down and select and deselect the students that you want to actually see and complete that assignment. And so I'm just going to show you what this looks like. If I go into this assignment here and I click edit, you can see the four uh, option up here in the top right hand corner. And if I click, you can see it's assigned to all students, but I can actually uncheck that. Uh, or I can actually, uh, you know, decide to uncheck specific students if I decide that that makes the most sense. Okay, and then finally tip four is just making or finding instructional videos. Uh, you know, many teachers don't like to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you may decide that you want to just pull videos from resources that already exist. And so in this PowerPoint, which is by the way, available on our help page that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you can actually get the link from this slide uh, and it links to uh, a few different high quality YouTube channels and accounts that, that share instructional videos that you may find useful. Uh, however, you may also decide to make your own videos and uh, there are many different services available for this, but one of them is uh, Screencastify where you can make free uh, five minute videos uh, and it's an add on through Chrome and we also provide the link to this in the PowerPoint as well. Okay, uh, now we just want to open it up for some more questions. Um, so, uh, Christina, if we have any questions that have popped up that are uh, yes. with the group, go ahead. Um, I have one question, and I'm going to, this person might have to unmute themselves and explain a little bit because it's a question about Google Classroom and uh -huh. there's a, and whether we can just get a link and send it out as a bulk post. Um, yeah. Well, the, uh, the quick answer to that would be that in order for a class to actually get the assignment and for it to function, you have to assign it to the class from, uh, from the assistance platform. Um, Christina, would you care to clarify any yeah. more on that? I think, I, I don't know exactly what a bulk post is, but I, I suspect it's like being uh, able to use it and send it to a bunch of people. But you have to be really careful because these links are tied to who's in your class and if anybody else clicks on the link and they're not in your class, like if you have a, like, like if I taught 10th grade or eighth grade and I have an eighth grader at home and I want my kid to do it too, I can't give my child that link and they go to a different school district. I can't give them that link and have it work. So right. the link is really tied to your Google account and who's on your roster. And that's really key. So you can't reuse that. You really have to go through the process you can, however, assign it to more than one class at the same time. So there's your bulk moment, if that's... Um... No, when I say bulk, I mean um, our school is trying to minimize the number of emails that a student receives. Ooh. So if a student's um, getting an assignment every day of the week for all eight of their classes, that's 40 emails they're getting. And so to minimize that, I do one post with five assignments and it would be overwhelming to a student if I have to post each assistment. It you would know, be better if I could just right, do a link. Yeah. I get you. Um, yeah. Sophie, I'm going to have to go explore. Okay. We actually had, um, actually, Brian, real quick, click edit on the problem set that you um, added. Yeah, yeah, that one. So 
we actually had a teacher who wanted to have his instructions ahead of his assignment. And you can't, uh, Google has yet to make these drag. So these two things don't drag, so you can change the order. And of course, he wanted to have the instructions and the information and then do the homework. Um, and he was able to copy and paste it within the class, it worked. So I am not gonna promise that you could do what you're, ask, you're thinking about doing. Um, the problem is you're gonna have to make an assignment each time and then it's gonna automatically send them an email, right? Or do you push emails, Sophie? I think I think she knew it's again. it's automatic from classroom. Anytime something's posted from classroom, then students receive an email. Oh, so wow. for all my other like for all my other work, if it's Google Forms or if I'm using like a Screencastify link, I'm able to get a link and paste it as one big bulk assignment from Google Classroom, so students only get one email. Yeah, I totally understand, and this is a, one of those classic distance learning. Yeah. <laughs> issues. Yeah. But I don't, I think that because we automatically put it into your Google stream and that's in, that's an essential part of our process. I don't think that, I don't, you can't prevent that thing that, that, that moment from happening. But that's definitely, you know, that's an interesting, uh, definitely an interesting issue that we should continue to discuss yeah. on our end. Uh, yeah, we sure. will. Uh, any um, other, any other questions, Christina? Somebody was asking about skill builders, Brian. Sure. So skill builders are problem sets that are organized uh, by Common Core uh, by Common Core standard. And uh, essentially what a skill builder does is that, you know, it's a long set of problems in the background and kids uh, have to answer three of them correctly in a row to complete uh, the set and, and be finished. Right. So uh, if I go into skill builders here, let's say, you know, grade seven you can see that we have uh, everything organized the same way as Common Core. Uh, you can go in there and we don't have every single standard, but we have uh, you know, a, the vast majority, or in some cases we have most or the vast majority of them. Uh, and for what we have, you can go in and you can see for each standard, uh, we have a skill builder. Um, and so, like I said, students have to get three questions correct in a row before they're finished. And this can be really good targeted practice if you have a sticky standard that kids are really struggling with. Uh, any other questions, Christina? Um, somebody asked about how you can have a student redo an assignment. Ooh, good question. So uh, if you want to have a student redo an assignment, or let's say they get three problems in, they realize they've made some critical error and they just want to go back and show you what, you know, what they know, uh, you can click inside the report for assessments. Uh, you can actually, and this may be a somewhat bad example because uh, there's no data here, but you can actually, next to any student's name, you can click the triple dot and click delete progress. Uh, and that will actually, and then click delete, and that will delete their progress. When they click the link again in Google Classroom, uh, they will be taken back to the beginning of the problem set. Any um, other questions? Yep, the next question was, how do you give uh, feedback? How will students see the feedback that teachers make on individual student work? So if you go into that, the, the report that actually has data, first, mm -hmm. how do you give feedback? And then how do the students see the feedback? So maybe not that one, because did that have any feedback? Yeah, I don't, know. I don't know that that would. It's in your uh, class, so go down to the bottom there, that one, 7.2. Okay. That one has data. All right. Okay, so uh, let's say you want to give students feedback uh, on an open response. So um, what you do there, you can see here's an open response question that these students received. You can click essay scoring. And from here, you can actually go ahead and enter student scores. Um, and then you can place uh, a feedback comment as well for them. Uh, and then finally, if you decide you want to talk about some of these later in class with your students, you can go ahead and uh, order some of them uh, and do a sort so that the ones that you want to review appear at the top of this uh, report. Uh, once you've, at, you know, obviously when you enter things into these boxes, uh, it will save, uh, but in order for the student to see those things, they have to go and look at their report. So if you're, for instance, assigning an assignment in assessments and uh, you want students to go back and look at their data, you may decide to post the assignment and uh, with a prompt uh, to, you know, once you're finished, uh, go ahead and reflect on your data report uh, for each question where you didn't get it right on the first try, uh, explain uh, where you might have gone wrong or a, a term or a word that you misunderstood uh, in the question, right? 
and the students can always get back to their report from their link. Correct. The they, you know, the same way that you can go to your classwork tab and see your assignments, they can do that as well. And they can always go back uh, to that assignment and click that link and look at their report and also look at the feedback uh, that you gave them. Uh, any other questions? No, but um, somebody just said that uh, that if you're worried about students getting too many email notifications, students can individually turn off email notifications. But that, of course, may then defeat the purpose of getting them notified at all. So, but there there are, I guess, ways of them making changes to their notifications. It's an interesting. Yeah, it's definitely one of those sort of uh, sticky issues uh, with with distance learning that's become more relevant, right? Um, any other questions? Um, that's, um, there's been some questions about what kind of feedback teacher, students get. Can you either show a student view of that practice problem set that you assigned or, or um, just do the, the student view from there, I guess? Yeah, uh, I can do the student view from here. So, uh, and again, student view, you can look at this and see what your students will see. Um, but uh, just to show you, and again, this is the set that teaches students how the platform works. Um, but let's say, uh, you know, basically the student will get feedback on whether their answer was correct or incorrect. Uh, so let's say here, um, you know, I'm not reading the directions or not paying attention and I put two. Um, it's gonna tell me, okay, two is not correct, try again. Now, if I put uh, five, the correct answer, you'll notice that I get a green X. So we have these uh, sort of three symbols that students get a green check that shows that they got it right on the first try, a green X, which means they got it right within three. And then uh, there's a red X that shows that they took more than three attempts to get the question correct. So let's say I do that here. Just put a bunch of incorrect answers in. And notice that my progress bar with each attempt, it goes down 33%, so you get credit within three attempts with your students. Now I'll go ahead and put in the correct answer, and I get that, uh, that red X as well. Um, if your student clicks show answer, that will actually generate a uh, yellow highlighted red X. And the symbols, by the way, will show up the same in your report. So if a student has to click show answer to move on, you get this bright yellow highlighted box that shows you this student could not move on uh, without this, this piece of help. And so you really know which uh, questions the students are struggling on the most. All right, any other questions, Christina, before we move on? I think let's just go on and see what else we've got coming up. Sure. All right, so uh, making sense of data with your students. Once you've assigned problems, maybe you've given, uh, you know, you've assigned sets and differentiated those for different subgroups within your classes. Now you might be thinking about, well, how can I analyze data when I'm not doing a report review uh, with them in class? And just to clarify, we talked already about how you can address, uh, you know, how the teacher teaches from in, in a distance learning context. Uh, now we're going to talk about how you can analyze answers and data together with your students from a distance. So we're going to talk about uh, four ideas for reviewing data with your students uh, today. Uh, they include a notice and wonder using the item report, writing about a common wrong answer, uh, providing individual feedback and whole class feedback, which I believe we already uh, covered anyway. So our first example here, you know, typically in class, you might review your report data with students, uh, show the report on your projector, uh, and then, uh, you know, share your, share your screen and, um, or sorry, uh, review data that is, you know, worth reviewing, you know, did they get low percentages uh, on certain questions? Uh, are there certain answers that you can pick apart with them? But you can't do that face-to-face uh, -face now, so instead what you can do is actually pick a screenshot of your item report. And you can, by the way, click the arrows in any column to curate this data before you take a screenshot. Uh, and then uh, post that with a prompt for students. Uh, in this case, we said, yesterday we did these problems and this is how uh, students did. Write at least two things you notice and two things that you wonder uh, about the outcomes you see here. Uh, and so this is a way to engage students in the data and then you can look at their response and see, uh, you know, how well they understand what they're seeing, uh, maybe gauge their level of understanding about the material that was covered, et cetera. 
So Brian, yes, someone was asking for a closer look at that report, and maybe you could go and show it in the in the in assessments, and then show how those sorts work that you were just talking about. Sure, uh, and and we were going to talk about as well the uh, uh, I blew up the example here so that uh, teachers could take a look at this data oh, cool. and actually respond to the prompt in the chat. Oh, cool. Uh, so if you would, just to act out being a student here, uh, take a look at this data right here and see if uh, anybody can draw a conclusion uh, or a thing that you notice or a thing that you wonder uh, from the report data that we see here. I'll draw your attention because I know we have a few people who are new to the platform. Uh, each column here is a question. When you're actually using the platform, you can click uh, the column header and it'll pull that question out in student view so that you can talk about it or demo that question. Um, and then each row is a student. Here we've anonymized them and you can do this in your own reports. Uh, and you can see each row shows how the students performed, uh, et cetera. All right, uh, Christina, so uh, did we get any uh, responses for this prompt? Uh, yes, we got one. Two students understand the lesson and two don't. Interesting. Uh, so if you look at these two, or if you look at these scores, uh, we can see that two students got a 93 and a 75. So uh, let's say your threshold is a 70. Maybe those students quote, students, quote unquote, understand the lesson. And then you have these two students with a 63 and 35. Uh, and maybe you can consider them uh, in need of some kind of remediation, right? Um, just to uh, kind of show you a report. So I know that just came up. Let me see if I can find one here. Pull this one up. So uh, you can toggle. Oh, Brian, we, we got another one. I noticed that the common wrong answer was 9.42% on the third question. Ooh, interesting. So actually what that says is that 42% of students who got this question incorrect put the incorrect answer nine. Uh, so this doesn't actually say 9.42%. It says nine students, uh, comma, put or sorry, <laughs> it says 42% of students uh, put nine as the incorrect answer among all students who put an incorrect answer. And then somebody else asked, why are the questions in the report titled in abstract codes, example, the PRs versus the problems? Right, question. so uh, the codes are how we manage things on our end. Uh, so uh, obviously that's what you see in the uh, report here, but if you want to actually look at that problem, you can click it and it'll pop out so that you can talk about it with your students if you happen to be reviewing data with them, or let's say uh, you wanna look at it uh, on your own time as well. Students have the ability in their own reports uh, to hover over the uh, each problem uh, link and it will show them what the problem is as well. Also, um, someone, someone else asked about building and when you do, if you do get to the more advanced mode of being able to reconfigure your problem sets, then the number isn't as important and it doesn't, it doesn't follow along. So it's, a, it's right. tricky to keep like number three because you might reorder it and have number three come first and number two come after. And if you do that, then number three doesn't make, mean anything anymore and so we're, we uh, we're not going to get too much into uh, into anything about building today. Uh, so uh, just to just to go ahead and move on, um, uh, the common wrong answer investigation would be the second idea for how you can engage students with this data. Uh, so uh, in this example, you can actually just take a screenshot of a particular question you want to discuss. Uh, in the report that I just showed you, uh, here's the same uh, data point, but we actually pulled this out for students to look at. Uh, took a little screenshot, and we're prompting them here to ask uh, why is nine incorrect and what misunderstanding uh, students might have who answered nine. Uh, and so just to kind of model this, uh, if you would, uh, a few uh, participants, go ahead and share where you think a student might have made a mistake here, and then we'll have Christina share some of those out. All right, Christina, uh, any responses? Not yet. No worries. Still doing the math out there. <laughs> right. 
We'll give about 10 more seconds. Okay. Uh, well, just as an example, oh, we do have one, uh, Christina. Uh, they found the area was multiplied by nine. Ah, interesting. And so uh, obviously you're commenting in the chat box here in Zoom, but you might prompt your students to comment on the assignment and then that'll be a way that, uh, uh, or comment on this prompt that you've created as an assignment in Google. Uh, and then you can take a look at their comments and gauge their level of understanding of the material that way. All right, so just moving on one second. So there's another question here, Brian. Uh huh. When can the students see the report? Good question. So the students can see uh, their report when they finish the assignment. Uh, they'll be led to their own report. Uh, after they finish the assignment, they can always go back and click that link to the assignment and they'll always be taken back to their report. Uh, but they see that when they finish the problems in the assignment. And what they see is a little bit different from what you see. Uh, they see uh, you know, the problems that were assigned, how they did, and what the class average was for each of those problems. Uh, and obviously, if they did an open response and you gave feedback, they would also see that as well. Right. And I would say that before distance learning, we would always recommend that teachers then took that report, the big one, and then hide the students' names and just share it with the class. And I think some of these ideas that Brian's sharing are kind of a workaround to get that information, like that group information out to the class. That's the hard part. It's mm -hmm. All Absolutely. these blue slides. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. You're welcome. All right. So uh, the uh, the third sort of idea here is commenting uh, to individual students. Uh, I know a few people have already mentioned uh, how can you uh, send individual messaging to students. Let's say you look at your uh, item report. Uh, you determine that there are one or two kids who really just need a feedback message or maybe uh, a follow-up, uh, you know, with a, a problem that you want them to try out or an instructional video, what have you. Uh, so you can actually send individual comments to a student within an assignment. And to do this, you'll click on the assignment in the classwork tab, and then you click view assignment uh, and at the, at the bottom of the dropdown. And then under the student work tab, you'll see the list of students. Oh, it's kind of loaded incorrectly. And when you actually click on one of those students, it'll open up a dialog box where you can go ahead and send them a comment, they can respond, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you what this looks like. I'll go back over here to my, or rather your class. Uh -huh. I'm gonna click view assignment. And then you can see the students are listed here. And if I click one, uh, it opens up this box here where I can go ahead and send a comment. Uh, question uh, or uh, a follow-up resource for that student. Okie dokie. Uh, so idea four is connecting students, uh, uh, connecting with students via email. I'm not going to spend uh, a whole bunch of time talking about how to send kids emails because I'm sure uh, everybody in this chat right now is very familiar with how email works. But I did just want to highlight that uh, if you go into Google Classroom, uh, and let's say we'll go back to the classwork tab here and you click view assignment and you're on the student work tab here. Uh, there's a mail symbol uh, where you can actually uh, click that and choose to uh, email selected students uh, as, you, as you need. So you can actually send uh, email messages to your students directly through Google as well. Okay, uh, now I just wanna open it up for any more general questions. Um, feel free to go ahead and post those in the chat and uh, Christina will share those out loud if there's anything uh, that we can share with the group. So while we wait for those, I have a couple from the past. So one um, is about uh, what it's like for a student when they're very, the first time they click on the link. Uh -huh. And maybe you could show, um, on our website, how we added that video. We added it, we have two resources for, for parents, basically, and students. Sure. So uh, just to kind of, if you wanna get a feel for what that looks like, at our help center, uh, we have our, our sort of distance learning page here. And uh, down here, um, we actually have, um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Christina, we have the student tutorial that walks them through, uh, you know, what they, 
what what their experience is going to look like. Right. And then you uh, mentioned parents as well. Yes. Uh, we have we have our letter to parents that kind of outlines uh, the basics of what assistance is and isn't, uh, and what the symbols mean, so that when they see their own students' data report, uh, they know what those things mean. Yep. And so um, somebody else asked about what the um, the report looked like for the student, and that student video has a clear view of that report. So if, if they can watch that and see yep. what the students see. And again, this is, uh, these materials are all located uh, if you go to assistments.org and you click the Help Center at the top. We have our Distance Learning Help Center page. And then right here in the uh, sort of uh, pinkish purple section, um, uh, you can click uh, and look at either the student tutorial or share that video and also the letter to parents. Um, was there another question, Christina? Yeah, so someone was asking about, go back to that page for a second. Someone was asking about um, this webinar and whether there would be a recording sent. Um, and uh -huh. uh, that is a very good question. Uh, I will actually be sending a follow-up email uh, to everybody who signed up to attend this webinar with uh, the recording itself. So you'll have access to that uh, as well as the slide deck. Uh, for your reference. We also have uh, a copy of the video uh, of, of this webinar, but a previous session uploaded uh, up on our website here uh, under current user tutorial. You can click watch and see the same content that you're getting in this webinar right now. And anyone who came here and felt like they're missing some of the new user stuff, they can watch the new user tutorial. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So if you are, uh, obviously the session was mostly for current users, but if you're a new user and we're glad that you're here with us, uh, but you feel like you need a little bit more information, uh, again, on our help page here where it says new user tutorial, uh, we have the slide deck for, uh, that you can use or you can watch our webinar about the topic and, and learn more. Uh, any other questions? Nope. All right. Thanks, Christina. All right, so um, just to wrap up a little bit here uh, and just remind you, we have uh, several resources uh, at your disposal at our website. If you go to assistments.org and you click uh, at the top of the page, you'll access our help center uh, for distance learning, where you can access the materials that we were just discussing, our support modules that show you everything you need to know about assessments, and also uh, you can find our signups there for various webinars and virtual workshops. So another question, uh -huh. um, what about dynamic assignments? So assignments, I think, where different students are getting different things, but it's somewhat similar. Interesting. So uh, do you mean like, can, can you do that with assessments? Like, can you uh, like random order, or linear order, that sort of thing with the problems? I think that those different things, I think it's skill builders sort of fit into that. We're not really like, like, like every student, one of the sweet spots of assessments is every student gets the same problem so that you can go over the report like you explained. But I think show the skill builders maybe one more time because that is a place where students get different things. Sure. So uh, again, we have our skill builders. Skill builders are where students have to answer three problems correctly in a row. Uh, to clarify, students don't get the same three pro don't get the same problems in the same order. The problems are given out from the big set in the background randomly. So each student who engages in the skill builder will typically be started with a different problem and engage with a different set of problems uh, for the most part over the course of the assignment. And then you can see we have those sorted by grade level and then by uh, common core uh, as well. So you can see those. Okay, any other questions? Someone was asking if skill builders are updated. That's a great question. We actually are in the process of uh, getting skill builders as up to date as possible, making sure that all of the critical skill builders that teachers might want to use uh, are available. Uh, but that's something that's an ongoing project. Uh, Right now we have uh, many skills represented, but there are gaps. Uh, I think most of what we have is uh, in the middle school uh, range, but we do have skill builders for some skills in lower grade levels as well. Um, but that is something that we're currently mindful of and something we're trying to build out uh, going forward. All right. Uh, and just to wrap up here, and you can keep posting questions if you still have them, we'll definitely address those at the end. 
Uh, but uh, the other option you have in terms of uh, engaging with uh, assistments is also just joining our Facebook user community. Uh, the link to this is located in the PowerPoint on our Help Center page. Uh, you can go here to share tips, ask questions, learn from teachers who've been using assistments for a long time uh, and other assistance experts and just engage with our team in general as well. Uh, finally, if you still have questions after this webinar, you can feel free to either head to our website, which is www.assistments.org, or feel free to email us at contact at uh, if you have any specific questions. Uh, and I'll go ahead and open it up again right now uh, just to see if anybody else has questions uh, before we uh, close out for today. So someone was asking about um, combining problems from two different problem sets. So maybe this is a good time for a plug for Dawn's webinar for next week. Absolutely. So uh, we are having a, uh, and she is actually doing, Dawn, uh, one of my uh, wonderful co-workers who's been doing some of our webinars uh, for new users as well, is actually having a session uh, that's posted on our Help Center uh, page. So you can go there and sign up if you're interested, talking all about uh, how you can, if, you're, if you really have a critical need to customize your material uh, or combine problems from different sets, uh, we do have uh, an immediate way that you can do that while we uh, are waiting on the release of uh, the builder for 2.0, which is where you'll be able to do that eventually. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, well, at this time, I just want to thank everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Please feel free to uh, follow up with us at contact at assistance.org if you do have any questions. Uh, and just make sure to click uh, leave meeting in the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom uh, to make sure that uh, you actually exit the webinar. Um, and again, thank you so much.